thanks for coming. You brave the, I guess the first real snowstorm of the winter, I guess, right? And uh, had some people that walked this morning and everything, so that was kind of encouraging. So kind of a silly question for you. How, how many of you guys, this is kind of reaching back a little bit, how many of you guys stayed up late on election night to just kind of watch everything as it came through? Um, I did. I don't know if I'd accomplished anything. Honestly, I kind of feel like all I really got in that whole process was to lose a few more hours of sleep. Um, but I do hope that you took part in your right your responsibility to exercise the right to vote. Uh, a lot of people made some pretty significant sacrifices for us to have those rights, so I hope that you did that. And this week we're going to continue the in but not of series with and now we wait. Maybe a little bit appropriate in this kind of extended election season since we still don't know who's going to be president in 2021. We had kind of a similar situation back in 2000. I don't know if you remember that or not. It took more than 30 days before we got that figured out. So here again, um, looks like we might be in a holding pattern for a minute or two. But it's hard to wait, isn't it? And let's admit it, most of us aren't really very good at it. So to illustrate that, I'll kind of throw out the whole restaurant thing. I don't know if any of you guys have done this. Um, you ever been to your favorite restaurant and just kind of jump started the process? You, you know how the process is supposed to work, right? So you you sit down and then you wait for a server to come. Hi, families. Raise your hand. He leaves and then you wait for him to come back and take your drink order and then he leaves again and you wait to place a food order. And it, those periods in there are designed that way. They're supposed to be filled with like glancing over specials and deciding what you want to eat and. Pleasant conversation, relationship building, you know, things like that. But it was just Sally and I, and we've been there before, and a lot of times we already know what we want to eat, so we're empty nesters. We kind of talk all the time anyway, so let's just kind of skip all that and just let's get what we came here for, all right? Bring on the grub. Let's go. So as soon as the server shows up the first time and sits us down, it's like, hey, uh, we kind of already know what we want to eat, so can we just kind of skip all the process here and just get to it? because I just hate to wait for things a lot of times. And don't even get me started at this red light down here at the end of Baxter, especially if you're trying to turn left and there's no traffic and you're just sitting there and sitting there and sitting there. It just drives me nuts. But it's been a few weeks now since our election and still we're waiting. You remember way back to week one of the series I close that message out with Ephesians 6, 10 to 13 to point out that Paul recognized the situation that the early church was faced with. And he recognized the situation as a battle. Not one against the rulers of the world, but against spiritual forces, against evil. Ephesians 6, 10 to 13 says, Finally be strengthened by the Lord and by his vast strength. Put on the full armor of God so that you can stand against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this darkness, against evil spiritual forces in the heavens. For this reason, take up the full armor of God so that you may be able to resist in the evil day and having prepared everything to take your stand. So we're fighting against spiritual forces, but can those spiritual forces and evil forces play a role in the actions of people? Can they play a part on the world stage through influence and manipulation of men and women? And I think if we don't believe that they can, we're kind of missing an important part of this passage. And we miss who it is that the armor of God is meant to protect us from. And we're to take up the full armor of God so that we're able to resist in the evil day. And then having prepared everything to take a stand. And I don't know if anybody remembers the verse that set the tone for last week's message. I even had you read it out loud. Well, it wasn't last week. It was first week. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. 1 Corinthians 10.31 
And I ask the question, does Paul's call to do everything to God's glory really extend to everything, even politics and voting? And I hope that you heard the answer to that question as a resounding yes, because that yes, that call to bring glory to God in everything is the foundation of this week's question. In a season like this, when tensions are high and we're waiting, what does waiting look like if we're waiting on God? What do we Christians who are in the world but not of the world have that the world doesn't have? So if you turn in your Bible, if you would, to Isaiah 26, we're going to try to figure that out. So the answer to this question might sound a little bit like I'm starting to preach an Advent series. A lot of times as we get closer to Christmas, the pastor's messages would cover the themes of the Advent, love, joy, hope, and peace. So after Pastor John's message last week about love, well, we're kind of on the right track here, right? So we're going to skip to the end of that list today, and we're going to talk about peace. Slide down to verse 3 of Isaiah 26. And this is from the Christian Standard Bible. You will keep the mind that is dependent on you in perfect peace, for it is trusting in you. Trust in the Lord forever, because in the Lord, the Lord himself is an everlasting rock. Now, this is one of those verses that I like out of the English Standard Version just a little bit better. To me, it just sounds more pointed, I guess. You keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord God is an everlasting rock. So did you pick up the difference? It's really subtle. Instead of the object of the sentence being the mind... The CSB says you keep the mind that is dependent on you in perfect peace, for it is trusting in you. The ESV's translation makes the object the man. You keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Now maybe I'm just reading too much into it. The two translations say essentially the same thing, but I just feel like the ESV ties the thought more directly to us as human beings. It speaks more to the relationship than the mechanics or the physicality of being human. Both translations, though, use the words that I want to focus on today to answer this question. They say perfect peace. If we're in the world but not of it, then we should have qualities. We should have a uniqueness that's obvious to those around us. And of those qualities, perfect peace is an important one. Perfect peace allows us to remain stable when the world shakes. And it's doing some shaking right now. It's sometimes a lot easier to talk about getting peace or having peace than actually having it, isn't it? Especially when we're in a period of waiting and there's a lot of stress going on. So how do we get peace? I'm a Harley guy, so you know I'm going to throw some motorcycle stuff in here. So there's a term that we use as motorcycle riders is hold your position. And we divide up a traffic lane into three sections, and we'll ride usually in kind of a staggered formation. And this allows each rider to be flexible when conditions change. If a rock or a pothole pops up and you're riding side by side or in close proximity to other bikes, it's kind of tough to make an adjustment. The staggered formation gives the riders a cushion of space to react to sudden changes, and trust me, in most riding situations, a cushion imparts a sense of peace. And most of you thought we were just spreading out to try to take up traffic on the highway. It's not really what it's for, now you know. A word of caution, though. Too big of a cushion creates problems. If a rider backs way off, a car is going to try to get his way in there and break up the group. And sometimes they'll take advantage of even the smallest space and kind of squeeze yourself in there anyway. And that can really damage your peace. You can't ever get complacent when you're on a motorcycle because bad things happen. You have to find your position and hold it by constantly looking around you and adjusting to what's going on. And it sounds super tedious and super busy, but actually... It's quite peaceful. 
Elder Marty is going to be restarting our Financial Peace University small group on Sunday evenings in January. And guess what step one in debt management process is? Create a cushion. It doesn't have to be exorbitant, but having that to fall back on in an emergency creates a sense of peace. Hence the name of the class, I guess. But again, too much cushion means a couple things. One, you tend to get lazy, even cocky. You think you got this whole thing whooped, and you take your mind off your long-term goals and you abandon discipline. And when that catches up with you, it's not pretty. The other side of that is you might be fearful. Every time an emergency comes up that causes you to tap into that cushion, you freak out a little bit that there goes all my savings that I've been working so hard for months to get, and now i got to spend it. And you change your focus from the goal to what's going on right now. Leading up to this election and even beyond it, we have seen Christians not really holding their position guilty. Some of us get caught up in this attitude of either we're king's kids, so we really don't have to deal with any of this. God's going to come back and rescue us out of this anyway. But you've got to understand, belonging to God does not exempt us from the human experience. The other extreme is panic. And God hasn't given us the spirit of fear. We read that in 2 Timothy 1.7. And it seems like King David had this figured out. Listen to his confidence in Psalm 27, 1 through 4. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom should I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Whom should I dread? When evildoers came against me to devour my flesh, my foes and my enemies stumbled and fell. Though an army deploys against me, my heart will not be afraid. Though a war breaks out against me, I will still be confident. I have asked one thing from the Lord. It is what I desire, to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, gazing on the beauty of the Lord and seeking him in his temple. So we have to avoid extremes of, on the one hand, being unconcerned and, on the other hand, being paralyzed with fear. So how do we do that? Now, David kind of nailed it. I've asked one thing from the Lord. It's what I desire to dwell in his house, to gaze on his beauty, and to seek him in his temple. Every crisis, every instance of unrest, every period of waiting is a call for us to seek God. If you look back for a moment at the story of Joshua at Jericho, Pastor John looked at the end of chapter 5. When Joshua met the Lord as he approached the city, so if you flip the page or scroll over however you have to to get to Joshua, we're going to get into the next chapter starting with the first verse. Now Jericho was strongly fortified because of the Israelites, no one leaving or entering. The Lord said to Joshua, look, I have handed Jericho, its king, and his best soldiers over to you. March around the city with all the men of war circling the city one time. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry seven ram's horns trumpets in front of the ark. But on the seventh day, march around the city seven times while the priests blow the trumpets. When there is a prolonged blast of the horn and you hear its sound, have all the troops give a mighty shout. Then the city wall will collapse and the troops will advance, each man straight ahead. So Joshua had just marched the army of Israel toward a battle. As that happens, as we approach conflict, we ready ourselves, don't we? We prepare our heads for the confrontation. We look for that place in our mind where courage and strength comes from and we shift our focus away from anything that doesn't have to do with what's coming and then Joshua runs into the commander of God's army that was an interesting conversation wasn't it Joshua learns that God is on God's side and I'm not sure what you took away from that but it hit me that Joshua needed to understand that same concept that I mentioned about God's values a few weeks ago, that God doesn't bring his standards down to us. He doesn't join our side. He calls us to raise our standards to his, to join him in a fight that he's already fighting. 
And in chapter 6, Joshua was asked to take that to the next step, not only to join God's side in God's fight, but to fight God's fight God's way. And that might have been a tough thing to accept as well. Joshua hears, look, I have handed Jericho, its king, and its best soldiers over to you. Sweet. That's exactly what I want to hear if I'm getting ready to walk into a fight. We got this thing licked. Let's go. And God's like, that, 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 hang on there a second, big boy. Listen to this. March around the city with all the men of war circling the city one time. Do this for six days. Wait, what? If that's me, I think I'd be ready to argue. I got all the guys here. Your commander's here. You just said we're going to win. What are we waiting for? Let's go get this done. And you're talking about March for six days? And that's why God didn't make me Joshua. Because it seems like Joshua didn't skip a beat. He was on board with God's plan immediately. God said, wait, and Joshua, instead of throwing out all the reasons he shouldn't have to wait, sought out God in that time. And then he carried God's vision, his battle plan, to the world around him. Think that was a tough sell? His army's ready to go. Verse 6, so Joshua, son of Nun, summoned the priests and said to them, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and have seven priests carry seven trumpets in front of the Ark of the Lord. He said to the troops, Move forward. March around the city and have the armed men go ahead of the Ark. After Joshua had spoken to the troops, seven priests carrying seven trumpets before the Lord moved forward and blew the trumpets. The Ark of the Lord's Covenant followed them. While the trumpets were blowing, the armed men went in front of the priests who blew the trumpets, and the rear guard went behind the ark. But Joshua had commanded the troops, Do not shout or let your voice be heard. Don't let one word come out of your mouth until the time I say shout. Then you are to shout. So the ark of the Lord was carried around the city, circling it once. They returned to the camp and spent the night there. So the troops are ready to go. But even though they're ready to go, and even though the tactics here seem a little shaky from a fight man's perspective, they follow Joshua's lead, and they wait. And they do as God says, with the result that God delivers on his word and gives them the victory that he promised them. Do we find ourselves in a season of waiting, whether it's for elections, or you're waiting for that job to show up, or you're waiting for your COVID test to come back, or you're waiting for that special relationship to happen in your life. Whatever it is, our natural response is to get anxious and agitated. We feel like we're ready to make a move. Let's go. But if we use that time to seek God first and to move only when he wants us to and in the way that he wants us to, we're going to find that the victory is there for us in his timing. And just having that knowledge should go a long way toward allowing us to wait in perfect peace. As Isaiah proclaimed in chapter 26, you keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. I don't know if this is blowing anybody else's mind or not, but you know Thanksgiving is like two days away, right? Three days, four days. It's this week. Thanksgiving and this 2020 that has decimated our lives pretty much, here comes Thanksgiving. You, you know that holiday, right? It's in between the two big commercial Halloween and Christmas. It's that one in the middle. That's what we're doing this week. Just want to make sure we're clear on that. I don't know what your traditions are surrounding Thanksgiving. Do you stand around in a circle or sit around a table and have each person share what they're thankful for at that moment? However you choose to do that, it's clear that an attitude of thankfulness contributes to peace. It's found all over Scripture. Paul writes to the Philippians, Don't worry about anything, but in everything through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. 
And to the Colossians, he writes, let the peace of Christ through which you were also called in one body rule your hearts and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell richly among you in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another through psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Thankfulness is mentioned a lot in Scripture. But even outside the Bible, peace and gratitude are linked together all the time. People like self-help guru Tony Robbins, TV mogul Oprah Winfrey, New Age alternative medicine champion Deepak Chopra, however you say that. The list is nearly endless. All these people expound on the relationship between gratitude and peace. There's a relationship author and coach named Melody Beattie. She writes this, gratitude makes sense of your past, brings peace for today, and creates a vision for tomorrow. The funny thing is, all these people that we would consider secular self-help icons or masters, they aren't coming up with some profound new way of dealing with how to discover the path to peace. They're simply parroting a concept that originated with God. I wonder if they know that. 2 Corinthians 4, 15 and 16 reads, Indeed, everything is for your benefit, so that as grace extends through more and more people, it may cause thanksgiving to increase to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not give up. Even though our outer person is being destroyed, our inner person is being renewed day by day. Some of you guys probably know that I tested positive for COVID back on the 5th. And of course, Sally's job immediately tossed her into quarantine even though she didn't have a positive test. And the requirements were that we had to maintain complete separation from each other. I couldn't even share the dog with her. So the dog had to stay upstairs, she had to stay upstairs, I stayed downstairs and got to spend uh, a few days in solitary confinement while I recovered. Now for me, it wasn't the disease that was the challenge. It was the isolation. Even with all the electronic means at our disposal to communicate with each other, I miss the proximity to another living thing. So if you're one of the many out there that are going through that right now, I feel you. And we're praying for you. People in the church are praying for you. If you've let us know that you've been afflicted with COVID. Even if you're not infected with COVID, there are other challenges going on in your life. I would bet on it. There's other health challenges that we face outside of this virus that impacts our ability to function well in this world. There are other things that are spinning us up in our head. Maybe it's political, maybe it's not. It may be causing a rift between you and your family or your friends. And I want to encourage you today with those verses from 2 Corinthians 4. I'm going to read them in reverse order. I hope you don't mind. Therefore, we do not give up. Even though our outer person is being destroyed, our inner person is being renewed day by day. And verse 15, indeed, everything is for your benefit so that as grace extends through more and more people, it may cause thanksgiving to increase to the glory of God. I don't know what you have planned for your holiday this year, and I hope that you're not one of the families that has either decided not to meet together, that you haven't been prevented from meeting together in some fashion. But whatever your particular situation is, take some time, not just this week, to truly be thankful for what it is that you have been given. And I'm not necessarily talking about the things of the world, the gifts that your heavenly Father has presented to you. And chief among those is the gift. Romans 5.8 says, but God proves his own love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Paul goes on in the next several verses to repeatedly refer to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ as the gift. This gift of righteousness that's given to us so that we can be reconciled to a God that is completely holy. And holiness can't abide the presence of sin. Jesus' sacrifice removes us from sin. 
We die to sin and are reborn into righteousness when we make the decision to accept that gift and to follow Christ, to become Christians. And that's the final thing I want to point out today in our short dive into how we acquire perfect peace. If you're searching for peace in a time of waiting or sickness or stress or any other thing that is damaging your ability to be at peace, commit to follow Jesus. You'll find it. That commitment is the foundation of everything that this series talked about. It's that commitment to follow Jesus that changes our citizenship from the world to the kingdom. That commitment to Christ makes us ambassadors of the kingdom of God to the world. As an, as an ambassador, then we have a different value system, one that we're called to use as we make decisions about our lives here. We exist with a different point of view. Pastor John referred to it as the biblical worldview. And from those values and worldview spring many things, two of which we've talked about at the end of this series, two things that should make every Christian stand out to everyone that sees them and make them ask these questions. Why can they love people that are so hard to love? And how can they be at peace when clearly everything around us is going crazy? When the world sees people that are sold out to the kingdom operating in the world, but not of the world, it will have an impact on the world. But we can't be hidden away in a corner somewhere waiting for Jesus to come and get us. We have to be out there making a stand for Christ and for his values and worldview out there reflecting the love and peace of Christ. We need to be visible and open in our commitment. Today, we, we as a church are going to serve as witnesses to a young lady that has decided to make that public declaration of her commitment to follow Christ. Samantha Moe will be baptized in just a few moments by her father. The Moe family has been a part of Baxter Road Bible Church since before we even became a church. And Samantha continues that today as this church receives her into the fellowship of baptized believers. If you guys would get ready, please come forward. We're going to watch this video. I want to get baptized because I'm already saved. I asked Jesus in my heart when I was four years old. And when you, um, John kind of like the baptizer, when he baptized Jesus, it's like he was like if, it's kind of like when you go down, you um, get baptized. It's like you're being buried like Jesus had, and then you rose again, and he was clean. And so why do you want to get baptized? I want to get baptized to show everybody I've been saved when I was four years old. And uh, who is Jesus to you? My Lord and my, the King, and I'm the daughter of the King. I want to get baptized because I'm already saved. I asked Jesus in my heart when I was four. I want to <laughs> that is cool. Daughter of the king. Uh, Samantha, I have a question for you. Have you asked Jesus to be your savior and asked him to live in your heart? Yeah. He did. Yes. With that good confession, put your hand right. With that good confession, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. How cool is that? This is like my favorite Sundays when we get to do these. And it's really cool to watch a family that's been here for as long as the Moes have been here to, to just kind of continue on doing what they've been doing since years ago.
Let's, um, let's pray. We're going to close out the service with a, a word of prayer, and then we're going to sing some more and go shovel snow. <laughs> Heavenly Father, today we come into your presence, and we thank you for this gift that you've bestowed on us. And all we have to do is reach out our hand and take it and commit to follow you and to do so openly. We thank you for the Mo family. We thank you for Samantha's good confession that she is your daughter. That's amazing. That we can call ourselves children of the most high God creator of heaven and earth and have holiness bestowed on us even though we're sinners every day of our lives to be able to stand before you at the end and claim Christ. God, I thank you for your word today. I thank you for the people that have attended here and that are attending online. God, I pray that your love and your peace and your strength would be laid on them and flow through them to the world around them so that the world can see Christians have something different. They have an anchor in the storm. We reflect God. Thank you for that. I pray your blessing over each and every person here. In Jesus' name we pray.